Google has announced that it's going to be pulling the plug on developing first-party games for its streaming platform, Stadia. That's one year and ten months since it originally revealed the service to the world. What happened to the original vision for Google Stadia games and entertainment? And how did it change so quickly? The story's still ongoing, so make sure to subscribe for the latest. Rumours swirled for years that Google was looking to get into the gaming space. Hell, even Niantic, creator of Pokemon Go, was a Google offshoot. But nothing else ever materialised. Until February 2018, when a report from the information revealed that Google was working on a streaming service with the codename Yeti. Yeti seemed to go on ice, sorry, for a few months until October 2018, when Google released a blog post detailing the upcoming Project Stream. It was a closed technical test in partnership with Ubisoft, where users could stream Assassin's Creed Odyssey to Chrome browsers. Those who were selected were able to play the game for free until January 15th the following year. As long as you had an internet connection that could hit 25 megabits per second, you could play the game at 1080p 60 frames per second. The tech test started on October 5th, and by all accounts, people were pretty impressed with it. In March 2019, Google held a keynote at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, where CEO Sundar Pichai took to the stage to reveal that the company had been experimenting with game streaming tech for the past two years, and presented Stadia to the world. Welcome to Stadia. We are so excited by this. Phil Harrison, who you might remember from the launch of the PS3, or the launch of the Xbox One, came on stage to give the full pitch. And what a pitch it was. Regardless of your feelings around cloud gaming, the initial demonstration of a player going seamlessly from desktop to laptop to phone to tablet to TV was super impressive. Best of all, there were no big downloads and no expensive hardware. Removing barriers to entry for players was a key feature of Stadia. It had other neat features too, like a built-in Google Assistant to help you get tips, the ability to play with your favourite creators using Crowdplay, and ShareState, which would let you share challenges with your friends. Its integration with YouTube offered an easy way to quickly launch games, as well as ways to upload your gameplay. Google promised that, at launch, games would be playable at 4K 60 frames per second with HDR and surround sound. It teased 8K for the future. But we also know the widespread adoption of 8K is inevitable. For developers, there was a whole other layer of intrigue. Stadia was a platform that could solve development problems by utilizing Google's vast cloud and networking infrastructure. Developers could create games in the cloud, and Google promised that a single Stadia instance offered more teraflops than PS4 Pro and Xbox One X combined. A perfect showcase to show the power of Stadia was Doom Eternal, and while initially skeptical about the tech, id Software confirmed that Doom Eternal would run at 4K 60 frames per second on Stadia. Google teased a multiplayer experience that was reliable and free of cheaters and hackers, all running on Google's cloud. It discussed the potential for machine learning and development, and promised cross-platform multiplayer and even saves. Harrison then introduced Jade Raymond, formerly of Ubisoft and EA, who had joined Google as the head of Stadia Games and Entertainment, the first-party studio dedicated to developing titles exclusively for the platform. To going down the bold path, learning what is working best, and sharing key tools and tech so that we can take games to the next level together. The way I see it, there has never been a more exciting time to be a developer. And Stadia will be a driving force defining the future of games and entertainment. Thank you. Watching this back now is genuinely pretty heartbreaking. On the GDC show floor, both Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Doom 2016 were playable. It wasn't the ideal testbed for the tech, but most press agreed that the games looked and ran great for the most part. But others noticed that Doom had input lag when using a mouse and keyboard. And I noticed immediately that, you know, my mouse wasn't tracking 100% perfectly with, uh, with the aiming reticle, like, it was laggy. Cutting ahead of the other E3 press conferences, Google held a Stadia Connect, with pricing, game reveals, and its launch info on June 6, 2019. For the most part, it was a pretty okay conference. It revealed Baldur's Gate 3, and Stadia showed off the list of developers it had on board, including Ubisoft, EA, 2K, and Rockstar. 
It showed off one Stadia exclusive from Tequila Works called Guilt. Gamers were promised 4K gameplay if they had internet speeds of 35 megabits per second and 720p 60 frames per second if they had 10 megabits per second. It showed off the controller and detailed the Stadia Pro subscription service, which would give you a free game every month, discounts, and let you reserve your Stadia name, all for $10 a month. There was also a service called Stadia Base, which allowed you to just buy the games you wanted without a subscription, but they'd be capped at 1080p, 60 frames per second. But there were certainly cracks in the presentation. You had to own a Pixel device to play Stadia on your phone at launch. To even play Stadia in 2019, you had to sign up for Stadia Pro. Stadia Base wouldn't be coming until 2020. Google discussed the Founders Edition at length, three months of Pro for you and a friend, a controller, and a Chromecast Ultra, none of which you really needed if you had a decent internet connection, Chrome browser, and a keyboard and mouse. And so the rumblings about the practicality of Stadia began. How much bandwidth would streaming 4K take? In countries like the US, where data caps are more common, was it feasible to use? An eye-watering article from PC Gamer at the time estimated that Stadia would use one terabyte of data in 65 hours. People joked about the Google Graveyard, a depressing website where you can check just how long Google keeps its products around for. Others questioned why they would need to add yet another subscription on top of services like Game Pass, PS Plus, and PS Now, all of which arguably offered better benefits and way more games than Stadia did. Seemingly to address these criticisms, Google held its second Stadia Connect livestream at Gamescom 2019 and pushed the titles that would be coming to the platform, like Cyberpunk 2077, Watch Dogs Legion, Doom Eternal, Elder Scrolls Online, and Mortal Kombat 11. In October 2019, a month before launch, Stadia Games and Entertainment opened up its first studio in Montreal. On the blog post celebrating the opening, Jade Raymond wrote that the team would produce exclusive, original content across a diverse portfolio of games in all your favorite genres. Founders Edition sold out, so Google announced the Stadia Premiere Edition that came with a Chromecast Ultra, a white controller, three months of Stadia Pro, and Destiny 2, all for the same price, but with the caveat that it would arrive after the Founders Editions. At launch in November 2019, Stadia had 22 games, including Metro Exodus, Destiny 2, Final Fantasy XV, and Red Dead Redemption 2. Reviews were mixed. Digital Foundry discovered that games were rendered at sub 4K and then upscaled. For 4K gameplay, you'd be looking at streaming up to 20 gigabytes of data per hour, or just under 5 gigabytes for 720p. If your internet dipped, you'd be looking at frame skips and input lag. Some Founders editions arrived late. As noted by Kotaku, multiple features were missing or just not quite right. The share button would upload your clips to the Stadia app, but you couldn't download them from there. Stream Connect wouldn't launch for another month, and Crowdplay wouldn't even go into beta for another year. StateShare eventually stumbled out of the gate in January 2021 with the launch of Hitman 3, it's still not widely usable in other games. While available on Pixel phones and Chrome browsers, Stadia, like xCloud and GeForce, was missing on one key platform, iOS. This was due to Apple's App Store rules, which stated that each game on the service needed to be individually submitted for review. Apple eventually overturned this policy and Stadia became available in December 2020, but you still had to access the service through a web browser. In December 2019, Google announced the acquisition of Typhoon Studios, an independent studio co-founded by Alex Hutchinson and Reed Schneider, who between them had worked on titles such as Assassin's Creed, Splinter Cell, and Arkham Knight. Speaking to GamesIndustry.biz, Jade Raymond said, There are always pros and cons to acquisitions, and I think when you find the right culture and a really good fit like Typhoon is, it's a no-brainer. But we take this very seriously. We want to build for the long term. Our whole strategy is a long-term one to make the right decisions. In March 2020, a year after Stadia's reveal, Stadia Games and Entertainment opened a second studio in Playa Vista, LA, helmed by Shannon Studstill, the former head of Sony Santa Monica. Google also started to offer free Stadia Pro trials for Chromecast Ultra users. With the world descending into lockdown, in April, Google offered Stadia Pro for free to new players and paused billing for existing owners for two months to try and help entertain people at home. 
In June, Google knocked $30 off the price of the Premier Bundle, but dropped the three months of free Stadia Pro. Throughout the rest of the year, Google would continue to run promotions, including giving free Premiere editions to YouTube Premium subscribers, as well as those who bought Cyberpunk on the platform. Cyberpunk, despite varying in performance on most other platforms, ran pretty well on Stadia. By the end of 2020, over 120 games were available, and several features including family sharing and messaging had been added. Which brings us to February 2021 and the unexpected blog post from Phil Harrison revealing that Stadia Games and Entertainment would be shutting down, and that the future of Stadia would be dedicated to its use as a platform, citing the exponentially increasing costs of game development for the decision. Most of the rest of his blog post discusses shopping the streaming technology out to partners, but assured gamers that Stadia Games and Stadia Pro would still be around. It's not the first time this has happened. Nvidia did the same things with GeForce, and Gaikai became PS Now. As astutely pointed out by Sean Hollister from The Verge, Harrison was on Gaikai's advisory board, and Jack Buser, head of Stadia Business Development, was head of PS Now. So it's a strategy they're both familiar with. Jade Raymond left Google the same day, and the studios in Montreal and LA shuttered, with 150 developers losing their jobs. Harrison said they were working on finding them new roles. According to a report from Steven Totillo at Kotaku, any game that had a release date beyond 2021 had been cancelled. Unlike Xbox or PlayStation, we have no idea how many Stadia subscribers there are because Google has never released any figures. The Verge referred to Cyberpunk on Stadia as the platform's make or break moment, and it's easy to see why. The biggest game of the year had intense technical issues on every platform except Stadia. By offering a free Chromecast to everyone who purchased on Stadia, Google was getting in front of more eyes than ever. But it seems like even Cyberpunk wasn't enough to move the needle. So as of 2021, does Stadia still exist? Yes, it does. Did it deliver on what it promised? In some regards, it did. But many of its most exciting features didn't come to fruition in a meaningful way, and the accessibility it touted came with numerous caveats. But perhaps Stadia's biggest failure was in the promises it made to game developers. It courted 150 people to come work for Google and build games for Stadia, and shut it all down before they could even release anything. This has been a pretty depressing video to make because the promise of Stadia was so strong for developers. For the most part, the streaming tech works and is being improved upon all the time. If Stadia's new plan is to be this platform to deliver games straight to the players, but never to deliver those astonishing games that could be made in the cloud, is that going to be enough to pull people away from competing services? We'll see. In the meantime, we'll always have the latest, so make sure to subscribe to keep up with Stadia. I'm on Twitter at Lucy James Games, and I'll see you next time.